switch over now to uh, focus on the Rattlesnake Creek Irrigation Innovation Project. And Heidi uh, Lee and Jonathan. Heidi, can you uh, lead us off? Okay, it's my presentation up there. We can see it. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming today. And uh, Lee and Jonathan and I are going to tell you a little bit about some grant funded activity that we have been doing in the Rattlesnake Creek Basin. So just to orient you, uh, if nobody, if anybody on the call um, is not aware of where Rattlesnake Creek is located, it's this purple polygon here. That's the watershed. Uh, the creek flows from uh, southwest to northeast and um, flows into the Quivira National Wildlife Refuge wetland complex um, here in the northern corner. And uh, I'm going to show the same uh, figure that uh, Dave Barfield did and uh, show that we're uh, focusing on a little bit different area of the High Plains Aquifer. So um, our target area is circled here. And you can see from the from this figure, the change in um, saturated thickness is uh, much different. So we're in a much different uh, hydrological situation uh, in this formation of the aquifer. This is called the Great Bend Prairie Sand Aquifer. Uh, much more shallow groundwater, higher rates of infiltration, and so uh, a different set of challenges than uh, maybe what folks are, are dealing with in the Ogallala Formation further west. Uh, the important point here is that there is not a continuous decline of groundwater, but there is uh, a seasonal impairment uh, that was found in 2015-2016 uh, related to the water rights of the refuge. So our team uh, submitted a conservation innovation grant and uh, we were awarded the grant in late uh, 2020. And so this slide shows our overall goals for the grant. We wanted to increase adoption of more efficient irrigation packages, soil moisture sensors, and irrigation scheduling tools, just kind of get some of that technology into the basin uh, to give folks uh, uh, enhanced ability to manage their irrigation water. Uh, number two, monitor improvements in irrigation efficiency and yield per unit water. And then three, facilitate a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring network to discuss successful strategies. Uh, really quickly, uh, through this grant, we were able to offer 50% cost share for irrigation system upgrades, uh, also free technical assistance. Uh, that's primarily been through Lee Wheeler, who you're going to hear from here in just a minute, and then uh, through Jonathan and his team, CanSCED Irrigation Scheduling Assistance and Workshops. And we also, we had planned for quite a few field days in our original grant proposal. Uh, we had to scale those back a little bit due to COVID, but uh, we did hold one in uh, uh, July of this year. So this is our flyer that we distributed um, to uh, show folks what is available um, <coughs> under this grant. And the important point here is that we do require that everybody have that level one base technology. That's the monitoring technology because we want people to be able to see what's going on with their soil moisture, see what's going on with their crop. Um, so everybody has to have the base one, but then the base two is optional. And that's the way we wrote it into the grant. Um, the folks with just the, the level one uh, monitoring technology serve as a little bit of a control. Um, for data comparison against those who go to that level two and adopt the mobile drip irrigation like Mani was just talking about or other system package improvements. The requirements for participation in the grant, you have to be located in the watershed. You do have to be EQIP eligible and, and verify that through NRCS. Uh, we're doing continuous signups and we do, we're just wrapping up year one and we do have cost share funds still available. So we are continuing to sign up interested folks. And we do ask that folks share their data with us on applied water, crop type and yields. And we do anonymize the data except where we have explicit permission to share um, names associated with the data. 
So a uh, quick overview of our results. Um, we had a goal of signing up 35 fields. We did get 29 in this first year. It's a three year grant. So I thought that was a pretty good accomplishment for our first year, especially given the, the COVID restraints we're working within. Uh, Lee's going to talk a little bit about water duty, but the best water duty we had was 21.2 uh, on a Milo field and 20.2 on corn. And we will go into more detail on those. Uh, we estimated a total of um, over $20,000 in energy savings across all of our uh, participants, across all 29 fields. And then one of our most important findings so far has been the importance of technical assistance. So having that technical assistance for you know, system maintenance and that well pump performance testing right at the beginning, um, some folks were seeing a, a major improvement just after Lee came out and, and uh, worked with them on the maintenance of their system and uh, did some of that testing. So that, that is a big need in the basin and has been one of the biggest benefits of this grant. So I'm gonna kick it over to Lee to talk a little bit more about the numbers. Okay, um, we had um, mostly cornfields. So there were 19 cornfields spread over 70, 80 miles from St. John uh, near the Quivera all the way down to the uh, beginning more near Mullenville, Greensburg area. And it's quite interesting the range that we had within the participants, 14 farms, 28, 29 fields. Uh, and we checked the uh, total water used varied from 11 inches on corn to 21 inches. And the yields were about the same. So the water duty that we like to look at is, is uh, just the yield per inch of irrigation applied. So in those 19 cornfields, we went from 10 to 20 bushels per acre uh, per inch of irrigation applied. Um, it appears though that around 13 and a half inches would have been sufficient for good yields from 220 to 280 bushels per acre on those cornfields. If that is so, then there'd be a 15 to 20% savings of water. Um, we, we applied about 3,000 acre foot on those 19 fields and uh, we could save a little over 500 acre foot if we uh, got closer to the 13 and a half inches per acre. The energy savings on those uh, 19 fields is about $20,000. So it's very similar to the water. So if you save water, you save energy. Um, we did have uh, natural gas engines, we had diesel engines, and we had electric motors. So the next slide. So we didn't have near as many soybean fields, but just in those four fields, we varied from 10 inches applied to 16 inches. So the water duty, uh, using the same bushels per acre per inch applied, uh, went from four to eight. And the one that had 10 inches was also an extremely high yielding. Um, the, uh, the yields uh, on the soybeans were from about 50, that's incorrect, they're from about uh, 55 to over 90 bushels per acre. The 90 bushels per acre was on the 10 inches. Next slide. So this is also, has impact on uh, water applied. So on these close to 30 fields, the flow rates varied from 380 gallons a minute to 1,070. The water right allocations for annual amount allowed uh, varied from a low of 86 acre foot per quarter section to over 240 acre foot per quarter section. All these things affect the um, the water applied. Um, most fields, I checked the fields from the first week of June, every two weeks. I went around to all the fields, checked the water meters, checked the operation uh, pressures. Um, and then I checked wherever the field was irrigating. 
I went to the end of the pivot and walked in about one span and checked the moisture on the dry side, just as the irrigation was about to hit it. And on most of those, the driest place in the field had very little deficit. It was more like 90% of field capacity. So things were kept on the wetter side probably than what we needed to. Rainfall varied quite a bit from nine to 19 inches from May 15th to September 15th. Um, the, we did detailed tests, uh, sort of following the NRCS uh, pumping plant evaluation that they cost share on. So we test the well, the pumping plant and the irrigation system because they all relate to each other. Um, that and the next one. So this okay. would be Jonathan or Heidi. Yep. yep. So we kick it to Jonathan. Okay. Uh, so uh, as, as Lee mentioned, uh, um, we they, there was an evaluation of the of the uh, of the system, uh, and that is actually a prerequisite to be able to make a good scheduling uh, before you are able to really make a good scheduling of your field. Uh, the system has to be operating op uh, optimally and. Now, if you are able to do that, uh, now you'll, you'll have several options to be able to feedback, to give you a feedback in, in, in addressing the question of how much water do you need, uh, when do you need it, and uh, where, do, where, do you, where do you put it? And so basically, I just put it into these uh, three categories, weather-based, soil-based, and plant-based, and there's a lot of technologies that are addressing some of this. Uh, and I think this is one of those low-hanging fruit uh, that in water management that uh, some of the farmers uh, have not really uh, got into. So next slide, please. So Hokanskid, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, is, is one of the free uh, weather-based tool uh, that is available for the farmers. And NRCS has been using this uh, in many of their programs. Uh, We've got, we were able to, uh, to monitor some of them, uh, many of the, all of the fields that, uh, were, mon uh, that were involved in this project. Um, we tried to get as much information as possible, but uh, one thing that we, we struggled was uh, getting those information of when the water was applied and, um, and also the, the timeliness of that application. But basically, uh, if there is a, a good data that is, um, uh, that is coming through, uh, we're able to get the crop ET, which is the consumption of the water, the rainfall that has been uh, that has been received in that uh, in that field, and there's another term that in terms of rainfall, which is the effective rainfall. So not all rainfall are going to be very productive uh, because it depends on the saturation of the soil. So there is that uh, effective rainfall. The gross irrigation as well as the net irrigation are also being computed, and these are all uh, entered into a uh, database. Uh, and, and the next slide will give you a graphics of what is going on in the in the in the soil profile. So basically, this is a summary of one of the field that we are monitoring. We try to as much as possible keep the line, the green line, in between the yellow or the amber and the blue, uh, so that the uh, the profile is not too full that it will um, uh, discard any rainfall as well as it is not too dry that it will affect the, the performance of the field. A couple of things that I would just like to mention. Uh, there, you, mentioned, you, you will see that uh, there is irrigation in rain on the bottom, uh, the dark blue and the light blue. Uh, there are instances that uh, even if it is raining, you're still able to, to irrigate just because you know how much water is in your soil. And so I just want to, to emphasize that, uh, that item there. And without you knowing that you still have that capability in the soil, those are the things that uh, you are unable to, to really figure out when you have to start or stop your irrigation system. Again, uh, next slide. I think I'll, I'll give it back to, to Lee. Yeah, this is just a quick rundown of a detailed example of a field that only had 400 gallons a minute. Um, it's shared with another field. The, the two quarter sections together have an annual appropriation of about 190 acre feet. Uh, a new mobile drip irrigation system was applied on both those fields and they irrigated together. There was a, applied 12.7 inches on the corn and they applied six inches on the neighboring field on the Milo. 
and there was a, about six to seven inches of effective rainfall. The yields, 235 for corn, 130 for milo, it's quite respectable. Um, the, and so these are the things that we call our level one technologies that you have to have uh, to be able to uh, ferret out what's making the improvements in water use efficiency, water applications. So you need a rain gauge at the field uh, with telemetry. It's, it's a, a step up from a rain gauge on a fence post. A pivot monitoring system that has a pressure transducer at the end tower. Probably 40% of the center pivots I've tested in the last 20 years have, are operating in low pressure. That means they don't have enough pressure at the end spans, which irrigate most of the acres. So we're not putting the water on evenly on most of our fields, many of them. We need, uh, we also require aerial images, um, which have several wavelength spectrums to look at the uh, contrast, crop growth, a soil moisture sensor, and uh, improvements to the irrigation system to apply water evenly to all parts of the field. That, that just has to be the starting point. You have to put the water on evenly everywhere in the center pivot, all season long, in the high places and the low places. And we also need to do things so that where the water falls evenly, it infiltrates where it goes in. Let's look at the next slide. Lee, we've got about one minute left. Okay. We'll wrap it up. So here's just an example of what happens uh, not too far west of us, a farm that I work with, they only had 10% of their annual allocation this year. And that's what the reservoirs look like in Western Kansas. Next slide. So here's the pivot monitoring example on this field. The green is where the system was. And each time it peaks is one more revolution. The dark blue is the pressure. Uh, and so you have to make sure you can see how much the pressure varies as you go around the field. Next slide. This is the can sketch graph that Jonathan showed. Uh, next slide. This then is a soil moisture sensor with a tipping rain gauge with telemetry that we had on this field. And you can see the irrigation events are every five and a half to six days with the mobile drip and the really suppressed flow rates. That's as fast as we could put the water on. We put it on with one inch applications. Is there a next slide? And then this is the aerial photography. We wanted to sort of bracket the crop growth in mid-July and in mid-August. And just to see how the effects of different things besides seed planting, fertilizer, previous crop history, um, the, the top one's a corn field, the bottom one's a soybean field. I think that might be all of them. Is there another one? That's the end. And I'll just really quickly, um, because I meant to mention at the beginning that our partners on this grant are uh, Big Bend GMB5, Waterpack, uh, the NRCS, and K-State, and all of these partners have been really instrumental to our progress on this grant. So big thank you to all of them. All right. Great job, guys. Uh, thanks. And, and always good to recognize the partnership because that's what gets it done. Uh, so thanks for, uh, for what you guys are doing there. Um,